We come this morning to chapter 21, verses 9 through 21. So would you give your attention now to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh adjacent, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. The grass withers, and the flower fades but the word of our God remains forever. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving it to us through the prophets and the apostles, for preserving it for us even to this day that we might have it here read in a language that we understand. Father, that we can even hold it in our hands so many, even now, are unable to do. Father, we count that as a privilege. But an even greater privilege is that we would sit under the preaching of the word with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. That you would give us spiritual understanding. That you would take the words preached from a fallible man. And that you would work them into our hearts and that you would teach us and train us, and correct us, even rebuke us for righteousness sake, that you would make us more like Jesus, that you would expand our hope. God, that you would increase our delight in you. Father, would you do that for your people? Would you help me? Help me, your servant. Would you protect me from error? Help me to speak with clarity. Give me grace, O oh God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you, O oh God. You are my rock and my redeemer. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot of sayings and expressions in common use today that I find not only to be trite, but also troubling. Truth be told, I probably spend way too much time thinking about this. But one of the expressions that's been pushed to the forefront of my mind as I've been studying these last couple of chapters of Revelation is this saying. The journey is better than the destination. Have you heard that one? The journey is better than the destination. Now, the sentiment there is nice. Sentiment is nice, and at times we all share it. Even I 
share the sentiment there. Lessons learned, memories gathered, growth experienced, all these are characteristics of any journey that we take. These often can be found to be more valuable. It's the reality of life. Sometimes that's more valuable than what we are working toward or to where we're going. I'm gonna date myself here, but I always think about how Clark Griswold's family felt in the movie National Lampoon's Family Vacation. When after all the difficulties they faced, they finally arrived at that theme park, Wally World. Some of you are shaking your head, you remember. And of course, there they park, they're the only ones there, they're excited, they're there early. <laughs> and they go running up to the front to find out that it's closed for two weeks for cleaning. And I can't get that scene out of my head where Chevy Chase's character punches Wally in the face. It wasn't the destination for which they were hoping. It didn't meet their expectation. This statement, the journey is better than the destination, the fact that it is often found to be true is a bitter indictment on life in this present fallen world. To think that when we achieve what we have long worked for, or when we reach the place to where we have long sought to go, and then we only find disappointment in how little fulfillment and satisfaction there actually is in the destination, and even the best things that this life has to offer, it's a clear reminder and it's a clear reminder of this, that you and I, we were not created for this world. We were not created for this world. It's a resounding call, and it stirs each and every one of us to remember that like Abraham who went before us, we are pilgrims. We are but pilgrims in this land. We are those who, according to Hebrews 11.10, and I quote, we are those who are looking forward to the city that has foundations, the city whose designer and builder is God. As followers of Jesus Christ, our journeys are going to be perilous, but they're not fruitless. Yet they are most certainly, listen, they are most certainly not better than the destination to which we're going. They are not. And while we strive to see God's kingdom grow and thrive as we share our lives and as we share the gospel with those in our community, we do so with heaven in our hearts and heaven on our minds. We look to the things that are above while seeking for God's will to be done here below, knowing for sure that nothing is better than the destination to where we are called. Why? Because the destination is God himself. The destination is God himself. In verses 9 through 21 of chapter 21, which is before us, John continues what we started last week. He continues to share his breathtaking heavenly vision, this time describing in more detail what he first saw back in verse 2. Would you look with me there in verse 2? He says, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, here beginning in verse 9, John has shown the bride in all her fullness. And we, like the congregation who stands, y'all been to a wedding, right? You stand and you turn and you look. You see the bride coming through the doors of the church. We now are going to turn our gaze to consider together this long-awaited appearing of the bride. And to help us grasp the vision that's given here to John, I'm going to lead us through it. And not surprisingly, better than last week, we had seven points. This week we have three. And these are going to make up our outline. So if you're taking notes, I'll go ahead and give them to you up front. First, we're going to look at the identity of the bride the identity of the bride. Second, we'll look at the glory of the bride. The glory of the bride. And third, 
We'll look at the shape of the bride. The shape of the bride. To fully understand the identity of the bride, we have to take several things into account. First, we must consider the words themselves that are used by the angel. Look at verse 9. The angel clearly says, Come, I will show you the bride. And then there's qualifying language, right? The bride, the wife of the lamb. The bride is the wife of the lamb. There's no doubt that the lamb is who? Jesus, right? That's, that's the answer. The lamb is Jesus. Jesus himself. And there's actually no doubt that the wife of the lamb is the church. The wife of the lamb is the church. The apostle Paul makes reference to this two times in his letters. First, you can see it in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, where he's, he's concerned with the unholy actions of God's people. And then when he's talking about it, he speaks of betrothing or engaging, giving in marriage, the church to, quote, one husband to present her as a pure virgin to Christ. So here he uses that language. And secondly, he uses it again in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, where he makes a parallel between earthly husbands and wives, right? And he exhorts husbands to what? Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So when the angel refers to the wife of the lamb, it's reasonable to conclude from the rest of scripture, I've given you two examples that he's referring to the church. So the second thing to take into account is the description given to what John sees coming down from heaven. What was called in verse 2, and now again in verse 10, the holy city, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. We need to see how it is described in verses 12 through 14. Note in verse 12 that the city has, quote, a great high wall with 12 gates. And what are on the gates? The names of, look, the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And in verse 13, it says that the wall had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Here we have pictured once again what we have already seen in the book of Revelation. The 12 sons of Israel representing all of the Old Testament saints. Okay, we have the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ representing all of the New Testament saints. You might remember that together, symbolically, they represent all the church, the 24 elders that are around the throne. Remember that from chapter four of Revelation? Okay, it's all symbolic language meant to picture the unified people of God from garden to glory, the church of all ages, of all time. It represents the church. So again, it seems reasonable to conclude that the bride is the church. But, you might be wondering, why describe her as a city? That seems kind of weird. Why describe her as a city? That's a good question. Well, to understand this, there's a third thing we have to take into account, and it's the parallel. It's not the first time we've described a woman as a city, is it? Chapter 17. Chapter 17, there is another bride or woman described as a city. We don't have time this morning, and I don't have PowerPoint or something like that, or I could show you this, but you can do this, right? You can go home and look at chapter 17 and chapter 21 and line these up, and you're going to see lots of similarities in the language together. In fact, from the beginning of verse 9 over to chapter 17, you're going to see one thing that's the same. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls wants to show John something. Do you remember what John saw in chapter 17? Do you remember? He saw the great prostitute. He saw the great prostitute. And what was she? A symbolic city. Babylon. 
She was a representation of prevailing worldly systems employed by Satan and his two beasts to seduce people away from God. And if you remember, Babylon is full of worldly inhabitants who practiced all kinds of immorality and idolatry. The the holy city now, Jerusalem, is full of righteous inhabitants of the new creation who remain faithful only to the Lamb. So just as Babylon, and I made this point back then, Babylon symbolized the false church of the satanic false trinity, that is the dragon and his two beasts, the new Jerusalem then symbolizes the redeemed community of the true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the church, the wife, the bride of the lamb. This is important. This is very important because if we were to read this passage... And consider it to just be a vision of a future literal city, we would miss its fundamental nature as a picture that God wants us to see. It's a picture of who we are as the church. And it's a fuller picture of who we are becoming as we move closer and closer to the final day when Jesus does appear to receive his bride. So let's summarize our first point this way. The identity of the bride is that she is the church. And because Revelation is a picture book, remember we've said that all along, it's a picture book, not a puzzle book. Because Revelation is a picture book, she is symbolically represented by a city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And knowing her identity then, is going to bring us to one of her major characteristics that's mentioned in this passage. And it's our second point this morning, if you're taking notes. Her glory. We see the glory of the bride. And it's mentioned in verse 11. Look with me there again. John sees in verse 10, the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Right away, hopefully now that it's in your mind, we must acknowledge once again the parallel to Babylon back in chapter 17. You can go back and look if you want, but in 17.4, Babylon is said to have been adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. Sound familiar with what we just read? Babylon is adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. Remember, she put these things on to make herself beautiful. And we talked as those who Love Jesus, even though she's alluring, we know it's ultimately like putting lipstick on a pig. She may be beautiful and and alluring on the outside, but inwardly she's rotten. Remember what's in her hand, that cup full of abominations? But look in contrast, in contrast right here in chapter 21, the holy city Jerusalem is not adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. She's constructed of them. She's made of gold and jewels and pearls. Verse 18 tells us, you can see, look, the city was pure gold. The wall was built of jasper. And verse 21 notes that each of the 12 gates were made from a single pearl. I learned something this week. In the ancient world, a pearl was of more value than gold. Some of you probably already knew that. I had to look that one up. To think of an entire gate being made of pearl would have been mind-blowing to John's audience. It's to blow our minds, too. And notice it says that the street of the city was pure gold. Pure. We can never purely purify gold. But here it's purified, like Glass, transparent glass. Add to this the truth of verses 19 and 20, which 
demonstrate the foundation walls being fixed upon. It says adorned, but the idea here is fixed upon every kind of jewel. It's, the jewels are built into it, right? It's part of what the foundation is. You can see that the bride's beauty is not just a facade. The bride, the wife of the lamb, is not just putting these things on to make herself beautiful. Her beauty is inherent. She is beauty in and of herself. Any student of the Bible would then have to ask this question, but from where does that inherent beauty come? I mean, connect the dots, right? I'm part of the church. I looked at myself in the mirror this morning and went, whoa. Not all of you did. I, mean, I looked at my wife and said, wow. Where does this come from? Jesus. There's your answer, right? It comes from God. This beauty comes from God. The, the purpose, think about the purpose of this city. The purpose of this city is the, the final fellowship of God with his people. And therefore, it is a holy place for his holy ones. And so the bride reflects the glory of her husband. She is, as verse 11 says, like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. The language here is to point us to see that she's been separated out from the world. She's been spared from the second death of the final judgment. She's been set apart for God. She's been washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Her sins have been taken away and they've been replaced with the robes of his righteousness. There is neither stain or remnant of sin at all. God has made her into something completely and totally new. Behold, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And now where we are here, having passed through to the new heaven and new earth, she's been fully transformed into his image. Now she's not only fully beholding his glory, she's fully radiating it as well. Many of you are familiar what happened to Moses when he went up on the mountain. We're not gonna talk about what happened with the people down below because that's what we're still doing down here, right? What happened when Moses went up on the mountain? Do you remember what happened in Exodus 34 when he came down? He was glowing. Moses was glowing. You can go back and read Exodus 34 today. I encourage you to do that. He was glowing. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 3 as well. He possessed the glory of God. It was shining from his face. So bright was it that people were afraid to come near. And Moses would even have to put a veil over his face to shield people from it. But now... Now here in Revelation 21, in the last day, God's people are shining even more so. What Moses experienced was just a dim picture of what it's gonna be like. God's people are shining as brilliant lights, like diamonds reflecting all the glorious facets of the full spectrum of light, fully reflecting the image of the glory of God in which they were made. I want you to see this. The bride is glorious, because the husband is glorious. Pastor Dennis Johnson says it well when he says, and I quote, the Lord of glory indwells his people and floods his new community with the beauty of his holiness. So we see then that the glory of the bride is her beauty, her inherent beauty of holiness, a holiness that is not her own, but a holiness bought for her and applied to her by the lamb as he has changed her from old to new. And now we come to our third and final point this morning where some of you are ready for my reckoning. 
the shape of the bride. Friends, I confess, I freely confess, I might be the only pastor in history to speak of a bride's shape in a sermon. I am on thin ice, I know. But after all, I'm safe because this is no ordinary bride and I'm just gonna talk about scripture, okay? Just gonna talk about scripture. If we look at the text and we look closely, we see that her shape is important. Her shape is important. In fact, verses 15 through 17 go to great lengths to show us that her measurements are important, even if they are indeed symbolic. So there's a lot of looking back here to the book of Ezekiel. It's hard to really understand this chapter if we don't understand all of the book of Ezekiel. I'm going to do my best to try to just walk you through this. But I encourage you, those of, those of you who are doing the community Bible reading, we've read through Ezekiel, so you know how confusing that can be. Ezekiel had a similar experience of being brought up and seeing the temple and having it measured. And so John is treated to this same kind of angelic display of divine measurement. And here the angel's using a measuring rod of gold And the angel goes about and the angel measures the city. And the angel measures its gates and it measures its walls. And here's what he comes up with. I think I've condensed it. The city is a cube. The city is a really big cube. Its length and its width and its height are the same. 12,000 stadia. That clears it up, right? And people actually argue over how much 12,000 stadia is. Imagine that. Biblical scholars arguing over things. It's about 1,400 miles, okay? Some say it's 1,380. Some say 1,400. I don't know. Let's just say, for argument's sake, 1,400 miles, okay? So it's a 1,400 by 1,400 by 1,400 mile cube. Symbolically, this picture. That's huge, by the way, that's big. A city that size would occupy the entire Mediterranean world from Jerusalem to Spain, the known Hellenistic world of John's day. So keep that in mind. But there's something fascinating here. This is where I get really excited. Something fascinating here I don't want you to miss. Much of the layout of this city, which you see in Ezekiel's measurements, but also going back to Exodus, which we'll actually be going through next year. But if you go back to there, there's a lot akin. The layout of this is akin to the Old Testament tabernacle, the whole four square idea and all the things being four square. So the tabernacle was also four square. And if you remember, Israel, as they moved, had to camp around the tabernacle And they camped around the tabernacle, three tribes on either side, just as there were three gates on either side. Okay, but here's the difference, and this is where it gets really awesome. Did you know that with the tabernacle, the only thing that is measured in the tabernacle as a perfect cube, length times width times height, was what? The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was the only part That was a perfect cube. That's the place where God's presence dwelt. It was where only the high priest was permitted to enter. But now, all the people of God, all the people of God are pictured as living here in this city, this picture of the church in the inner sanctuary to behold his glory all the time. Since the entire city is quite literally the Holy of Holies. Something we'll see very clearly next week. I wish we had time to get there this week, but in verses 22 and 23. Okay, let's read it anyway. (laughs) Look at 22 and 23. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Hallelujah. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. 
So, so you see, this city is not only architecturally perfect, but it's also the most perfect, intimate dwelling place of God. Because we're being built up into this temple of God, right? And we get to dwell there forever. We get to be there with him forever. I'll note here, you probably noticed that the measurements were in those familiar numerical values that were multiples of 12. You probably caught on to that. I have lots of math people in here. It's also symbolic. We've seen it already this morning. Uh, 12 represents for us the redemptive scope of God's covenant grace throughout all of history, Old and New Testaments. Also, the very size and scope of the city, I talked about how big it was, reminds us that the kingdom is vast, that as we've seen throughout the book of Revelation, God's grace extends beyond not only Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth, but also to countless multitudes of people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. You see, God intends to save an incredibly vast number of people and peoples. I'm going to say that again. God intends to save an incredibly vast number of people and peoples. And we should not only be encouraged by that, but we should also be fueled by it to continue sharing the gospel, not only with those whom we know, but continuing to pray and sending people out all the way to the ends of the earth. Well, I'm not done. I need to make one more note about the bride shape. And it's about her walls. Verse 17, you're like, why does the city this big have walls? Why do we need walls in heaven? It's weird. Well, it says the wall is 144 cubits. Of course, there's this huge debate. Is that tall or wide? Walls were usually measured in height. So we'll go with height, 200 feet. So physically, it's really hard to imagine a wall this short with a city that tall, isn't it? So what gives? I think the point is not the physical configuration. I think the point is to keep us fixed on the numerical symbolism, the picture. Richard Phillips explains this well. I'll, I'll quote from him. He says, the meaning of 144 cubits is that the wall encompasses the entirety of God's elect from all times. In this holy and eternal city, all of God's covenant purposes and the promises of the Bible are fulfilled. The entire vast number of God's redeemed people will live in the glory of his immediate presence so as to experience the perfection of life as God designed it in eternity past. It's a good quote. Here's what he's saying. The walls are there to contain the bride and to contain her safely, no matter how tall they may or may not be, to show that she's eternally safe because God has perfectly preserved her according to his absolute and sovereign grace that he chose her before the foundation of the world, that he gave her to his son, and his son won her salvation and brought her safely through to glory right here. And this is his bride. So there we have it. In this passage, we've discovered, or I've tried to help you discover the identity of the bride, the glory of the bride, and the shape of the bride. And as we draw our time to a close, I think it's right that we find ourselves wondering why this vision? I asked this all week. Why, why this vision? with its emphasis on the symbolic nature, the, the picture of the holiness and the glory of God. Why this vision? Well, I think we have to say that God wants readers of this book in John's day and in ours. Remember, this book is for all of God's people for all of time. God wants readers of this book to coordinate their present lives in this world with their destination in the age to come. He wants us to coordinate today with that bright tomorrow. You see, if our destiny is to dwell in a holy city in the light of God, 
to radiate the light of God's glory like a radiant jewel, this should inform how we live out this calling right now, today, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it have some bearing in how we live for Christ today? And of course you say yes. I mean, if this is our destination, then the journey to get there should find appropriate and fruitful meaning even if all those earthly destinations we encounter don't actually live up to what they promise. And they will never live up to our ultimate heavenly one. I read Philippians 2 in a new light this week. And I read it in light of this, and I want to invite you to do the same as we come to a close. If you will turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I'll look at verses 12 through 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Some of your translations might say complaining that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you by reminding you that God is at work in you. I know that. He is at work in you just as he is in me. And his work has the final goal that he will bring us safely into his heavenly abode. That same abode we've seen this morning. We are his bride. We are the wife of the lamb. And right now we are but dim representations of what we will be then. Even so, my hope, my prayer for me, for you, is that each of us will shine as lights in this world. That we will shine as lights in this world holding fast to the word of Christ. That's what we need to hear. Did you catch that? Thanks, Pastor Dan. I'll go shine my light and get my phone out and turn on the light. Uh Uh-uh. You can't unless you hold fast to the word of Christ. Hold fast to the word of Christ. How do I do that? Read it. Study it. Spend time in it. Come and worship. Sit under the preaching of it. Talk to others about it. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Hold fast. Hold fast to Christ. My prayer is that our glorious husband, the Lamb of God who took away our sins, would do that in us for our good and for his glory. Amen and amen. Would you grab your book?